We are in fact live. Um, hello everybody, welcome to A Branch of Laurels. This is a very special episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling it the Laurel and Apprentice episode, even though both of these beautiful ladies are in fact Laurels now. Um, Heloisa is uh, a Laurel who uh, recently relocated to Aitenbelt from Ontier. And Duchess Skegmare uh, is uh, in Ontier now and has also lived in the West and is the host of Grace Under Pressure. And um, both of them are good friends and I'm super excited to have them tonight to talk about their journey together. So welcome. <laughs> um, do you, where do you guys wanna start? Do you wanna introduce yourselves a little bit even though I just did or do you wanna just talk about how you first met? I think we should introduce each other. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> you start and then I'll okay. correct you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that is so perfect. <laughs> but I will start. Um, I mean, Duchess Dagmar doesn't really need an introduction because, you know, she's just the shiznit and, you know. Oh, is that why? <laughs> <laughs> and and of awesome, but super also just engaged in uh, both the reigning side of things and so people will know her from her time as queen but also like taking on projects being there for people we're going to talk about collaborative projects because we've done a lot and Dagmar mm -hmm. is where is the person who who demonstrated what that means to, to take those projects on and to contribute that to the SCA. When you've done a lot of projects and you've done a lot of largesse, you've done a lot for supporting people in all kinds of ways, helping people with their kids, helping people, you know, have, have their needs met when they're on site and they're having problems. I mean, Dagmar has this delightful sense of humor that you will never forget and you're blessed if you get to be around her and she just is I mean she makes me laugh constantly so you know I just I think she's uh extraordinarily gifted and still discovering new gifts in her ability to create art and express herself through art and um builds community and I love her to pieces and anybody who's ever had the chance to share a camp with her or get to know her is uh I'm pretty sure of the same opinion that she's a pretty special person a great leader and a great friend we should have rehearsed this because this is not the direction I thought this was gonna go <laughs> but like be like oh she's a laurel and she's a duchess and now I'm already like I knew I'd probably cry during this and I'm already <laughs> like starting to tear up and I'm like trying valiantly to blink back um <laughs> So now I have to, oh my God, now I have to be mushy. Um, so uh, just to start out, um, thank you for that. That was um, gob smacking. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> also, I'm not drinking for this. And normally I would have had a glass of wine and that would make this a little bit easier for me. But I thought my voice is already feeling a little wobbly. So um so uh Eleanor uh is also Heloisa that's her actual SCA name and I call her Eleanor all the time because that's also a period name so Heloisa um in fact uh I remember when you picked your uh SCA name and we were going through <laughs> French names and trying to figure out you know what could people reasonably pronounce correctly and spell correctly and all those considerations that make it those are really important considerations in the SCA because people are going to mess it up um, like a Chaxie or whatever. I don't know what a Chaxie gets called, all kinds of things, I'm sure. Um, so I think, I think though, uh, what's been the most fun is that you came into the SCA. You had been in for a little while, way back in, not in Ontario. So you had kind of your ideas of what the SCA were and then you came here and you, some of those you had to, set aside because your experience was so different in part because you suddenly were being thrust into a world by virtue of your friendships where people were very accomplished in the SCA and had done a lot of things and were really deeply involved at the kingdom level and it's a 
as I can say from personal experience, that is a very different way to come in the SCA than when you sort of ease in through like local participation and then you do more and do more, like the way that people more naturally flow into the SCA. Um, so you kind of got thrown in into the deep end and um, which is super fun. And I think, um, I'm not gonna get my math right, but I think you came around either I think just after my first rain. Yep. So there was a lot of momentum from that still too. And one of the very first things that we did together was cheese night, which we'll talk about later, but having a craft night, you know, and getting to know people um, in a sort of informal, more intimate setting um, was a, such a wonderful way to get to know you because your interests are so varied that I think if I had met you in the SCA, I would have been like, this butterfly wants to do everything. I cannot keep up with them. Um, I, um, when I met um, you, Heloisa, I think I was also feeling very burned out from our first rain. So it, you know, rains in Ontario can be very intense. There's a lot of travel and a lot of events and a lot, you know, because of the way our rains are structured, there's a lot of administrative work. And um, I can only imagine what my vein would have been like if you had been there because um, you, just the kind of person you are, how supportive you would have been. Because supportive is a word that I absolutely think of when I think of you. And it's not just me. You are the kind of person where if somebody has a need and you know you can help fulfill that need, you will go beyond beyond even your own limitations, your own um, good sense to help them, which I really appreciate about you because I've benefited from it a lot, but also because it you are one of the most generous people I know. And it is, it is you know, Ontier's really lucky to have had you as long as we did. Um, you know, I'm really lucky to have had you as an apprentice. Um, I felt super privileged by that, in fact, because I'm sure there were a lot of other people who would have really liked to have claimed you. But, you know, everybody has different Laurel apprentice relationships. Some are more formal, some are less formal. Yours and mine was very informal. We are friends outside of the SCA. We do a lot of other things together. I have a lot of interests um, and that collaborative piece that you were talking about, because you are so supportive, your, your sense of collaboration is incredible. And, you know, I very rarely have had you say, no, I can't help you with that. You always have something to contribute, even if it's, um, you know, can I help you find other people or whatever it is. So it's really, really important to me. And it's that you know, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't define it as loyalty. I know people consider that a value, um, you know, in friends. I don't, it's not about loyalty. I think you are a considerate friend. And I think you are a friend who really tries hard to be a good friend. And that, I, I think that's really important, you know, and it, and it comes across too in your conscientiousness for the things that you do to volunteer for the SCA. So, um, uh, Heloisa has been a chatelaine for her local um, barony. She has served as the baronial arts and sciences champion. Um, she's done a lot of projects for people over the years, um, a lot of supporting projects. She's helped run um, camp kitchens, you know, all those things that kind of keep the SCA going. So, um, and you were made a laurel three years ago now. 2019, yeah. Two years ago. All right. Yeah. Um, so in the before times, and um, thankfully you had a nice long lead up to your elevation so that you could get everything mostly done until the very night before and then be frantically up all night, which <laughs> is a thing that we do and we are going to talk about that. Um, anyway, so um, Aitenveld is really super fortunate to have you now and they don't know you yet the way we do, but when once they do, you're gonna have to like set up a perimeter alarm or something because they're gonna be <laughs> trying to knock, beat down your door trying to get to you. So um, yeah, anyway, it's the you. mutual admiration society apparently. <laughs> so, so clearly <laughs> uh, your, your elevation has not uh, diminished your relationship. Is it supposed no. to? 
So no, I, I kept, I continued to take the things for granted that she did for me and she continued to do them. I think that's, that's all. That's an ongoing concern, except you had to move out of kingdom to stop bringing me coffee at events. So I think that's a little extreme. Um, I'm going to miss that so much. That is actually one of my kind of favorite little rituals of, I love it. I like little acts of, of love. I like learning what people, how people yeah. feel loved and being able to, to give that. And, but you know what, I'm still going to come back. I'm going to be there for 12th night. Mm-hmm. Okay. Everybody needs to get Michael a job and come and visit their, um, stu- their workout studio there in uh, the Phoenix area so they can earn enough money to come back here all summer long next summer when we're doing events again <laughs> so that I can have my coffee in the morning. Um, it's not really an act of altruism though, let's be honest. That's, that's, a, that's service yeah, to the kingdom. Um, but, but in all seriousness, what I joke about taking you for granted, but part of what makes our relationship work as a Laurel and apprentice is knowing what you can take for granted about each other and what you really can't. And I think one of the things that has built the strength of our relationship over time is that we have, we both have really good communication skills, especially with each other. And if I'm upset about something or I feel like something didn't go well, I absolutely know I could talk to Eleanor about it and she would not feel deflated by that. She would be like, oh, I'm really sorry. That's, that's not what I meant or that's okay. Or if I need to apologize to her, I don't feel diminished by that myself either. And, um, you know, it may, it's part of that's just because of the strength of our friendship, but part of it too is just extending enough grace to each other that we know kind of where those lines are and what happens when we're approaching them. But, you know, huge amount of trust um, and also just giving each other like the space to make mistakes and not, you know, nothing's fatal. Um, But we also have a lot of shared values. And so that really helps too. It's, you know, so, but I would say, you know, it's not the same relationship I have with my other apprentices and that's okay too. I have a very different relationship with, with my apprentice Nita or my former apprentice Marika or um, my former appre- apprentice on Harid or Nimue or Celia, very, all very different relationships. So, um, and I wouldn't try to have the same relationship with another apprentice that I have with Heloisa. It's going to be different no matter what, so. That's the way I roll too. Um, People are individuals and um, I don't have a formula. I have a a promise to walk their path with them, whatever that looks like. So, Right. And I think the fact that Eleanor, sorry, Heloisa and I are both do like, we're good to go. It's like, oh yeah, I can do that. And we're off. One of the things probably that was the big, has been the biggest challenge for us. And it's not an issue in our friendship as much as it's just the a big um obstacle that we both had to learn how to work with instead of just trying to get around it is time management and so we've taken on some really um ambitious projects before without pre-arranging enough help and um you know kind of needing to go back and tap the same people over and over again for that kind of help. And so we've learned a lot about how to, how to engage people in projects, how to correctly set, like calibrate who can do what, how to, um, you know, how far to extend ourselves versus asking other people to do things. But it was, none of this was easy. This was all like through trial and error and lots of really late nights and we haven't really stopped doing that part of it like <laughs> no. no we're both visionaries and we both have big ideas about projects and it's it yeah. it's been a lot to figure out okay where is my expansive vision and how does that fit into my relationship with time management and <laughs> you know, and the, the, the recruitment that I have available to me for help because some projects you have a ton of help and some projects you don't. And yeah, yeah it's a, yeah. And, I'm and, not a manager and yeah, creative work is even different 
than like I, I don't know how much a corporate management skill set would be helpful when you're dealing with all volunteers in a creative endeavor mm -hmm. where um, you know, you're managing, you, you have some people that maybe you've known well and some people that you hardly know at all or who are completely new to you and you don't know their skill sets. And there's just a lot to, there's a lot of complications. Um, and so it's really, you have, you know, we, we'll get into all of that later, but it's, yeah. but it's been a, been a lot of learning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you, the two of you meet? I don't remember. <laughs> that was before, <laughs> once I have a, I, <laughs> Before 2008, I had a kid in 2008, parts of my brain went away. Anybody who was in my life at, in 2008 has always been in my life. And I don't remember how I met you almost without question. That's going to I be I love true. this story. I love this story. Uh -oh. I remember it so well. Okay. So we met at a party at a friend's house on New Year's Eve. Sounds good. Yep. Yep. Um, Michael Gilbert. Oh, and right. Right. <laughs> right. And so here we, we come into this party and we see each other and we're like, our hair is the same color. Like I'm the tall version and she's the short version. And we ended up, um, our friend had this kind of fun project to do that evening of making gingerbread houses. That's right. And we just like jumped on it. And I don't think we let anybody else. They were like, can I do some? And we're like, if you do it the way we are doing it, you know, which is the right way, then of course, feel free. Perhaps you'd like to put down an M&M trail over there where we can't see it. You know, it was, yep, I, yep, I do remember that. Colors. <laughs> <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod completely together on this project. And then the next right. thing I knew, I was camping at an SCA event with you. Yeah. And we took tango classes together. Um, Eleanor was really involved in sort of the nouveau tango thing that was going on in Seattle for a while. And um, I was never going to be much of a tango dancer since I come up to most people's navels. Um, but it was super fun. And actually, Thorin and I joined in on some private classes that were set up just for our friend group you know you switch partners a lot so it was actually kind of nice because we all knew each other you didn't have to dance with complete strangers and we did tango for a while yeah. I mean can I tango no was it fun <laughs> yes <laughs> we tangoed together at a goth club where I oh yeah lead you through a song and it was super like oh my god I'm leading this is yeah so it was, that was really fun. So there's like all this other, you know, clubbing. We did a lot of clubbing. I almost included some pictures and I'm like, eh, people don't really need to know about that side of our lives. But, um, but the SCA enhanced all of that. It, it really did. And, you know, the fact that you were kind of looking for a place to be, and I was looking for people to be with us. Um, Thorin and I have, don't belong to households typically. We've never really done that. So we, we kind of go and we camp with whoever will have us, or, you know, um, if it's not a royal encampment, it, you know, we don't tend to have like a group. And so it's been nice, um, you know, that, Hel uh, Heloisa and I could kind of anchor onto different groups based on each of our connections, um, which are different. And that's, that's also really cool. You know, your apprentices can bring a lot to you, you know, where it's like, oh, I don't have people who, from that area, or I don't have people in the archery community or the whatever in my friend group. Um, now I do. Now I have this like cool into a community of people that are you know, or whatever, I'm just making something up, but, you know, and I think that that's really important. You know, um, Heloisa had friends and connections that I didn't have. So, so she remembers how we met. Sorry. <laughs> no. I... So how long did it take for you to um, start talking about having that, uh, uh, an apprentice laurel relationship in the SCA? A long time. Yeah. I mean, I mean Nimue was my apprentice already, right? Yeah. Um, because they, um, but not too much before then. You know, I, I, um, I took on on Harid in my right after, right before the rain. I think right before the rain, and then you were not 
you were like a while after that, but mostly it was, it was more like, Hey, I don't want to mess up a friendship with something that could be seen as hierarchical. Um, but then when I realized that she really liked, um, that, <laughs> you know, that we could play with it, but I, but it's, you know, based out of respect. So if I said to her, I think you should do this. And she's like, I don't want to, that's fine. But generally speaking, it was, a, it was fun. And also that, you know, attaching herself to, to our kind of ducal household or royal household was fun too. So, but yeah, it took a while. Um, I didn't want to just collect apprentices was part of it. Um, but my first apprentice, Celia, who we'll talk a little bit about towards the end, I took on knowing she would probably never really want to do the, the work to become a Laurel. She just wanted to belong to our household. Um, and then Nimue um, no longer plays in the SCA. And then Anharid, um, who is not Duchess Anharid, but um, my Anharid um, became a pelican and had life happen to keep her from really getting involved in the arts. So, you know, when, by the time I was talking with Heloisa, it was like, you know, I have these people, but I, I don't know how serious they are about wanting to be elevated. And I was made a Laurel in 2000 ish. I don't remember exactly when, but I was never apprenticed to anybody or studented or whatever. So I didn't really have a, um, I didn't have a roadmap for what that would look like for somebody to kind of guide them along that path anyway. I just knew other, I saw other people doing it and I'm like, oh, that looks like a lot of work. I don't know if I want to do, you know, I don't know if I want to do that, you know, or I don't know if I want a kind of a, a stable full of people where am I actually going to be in the way of their becoming elevated because of all the other things I was busy with. So it, it's a lot when taking on the responsibility of being someone's mentor is a lot. Yeah. And um, I'm still learning. Yeah. You know, um, when I, I had two apprentices at first and I stumbled a lot with both of them. Um, it ended up working out okay. <laughs> But there are still things that I did that I, I regret a little bit. Um, and I didn't take apprentices for a long time after that. Yeah. Um, we were it was a big deal for me to even like become apprentice because mm -hmm. for a long time I thought, I don't need to be apprentice. I'm just going to do my thing. But I really did realize that I, I did want and would benefit from and did need that um, those tips of, you know, just somebody who could kind of give me a hint as to direction, because I do just love so many things. And it's really easy for me to just go, oh, I'm going to pursue that shiny and this shiny over here. And, and having somebody who, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to have somebody totally, you know, have a roadmap for me, but I did need somebody to advise me mm -hmm. and to have that kind of explicit in the relationship that like hey this is okay this is absolutely okay because you know friendship will there's a there's a level of kind of input that somebody will give in a friendship but what I wanted was more than what was you know explicitly acceptable in most mm -hmm. expectations of friendship and I think that's been really the the part that was so special for me when I thought about it I was like well I'm already being mentored. I mean, mm -hmm. I learned to hand sew from Dagmar. I learned. Oh yeah, those those largest projects. Like, yeah. I didn't know anything about hand sewing. You mm -hmm. taught me everything that I, you know, to start out with on hand sewing and seam finishing and how to do rectangular construction. I mean, I bought a book on on rectangular construction, but like you were already my mentor and teacher, and um, and I don't have any problem looking for information and finding information but but we already had that relationship the the mm -hmm. apprentice laurel kind of official thing just kind of gave us more permission to dive deeper into the dynamic we already had in place and, and well go, go ahead, ahead. Uh, i was just going to say you learned how unplanned 
a lot of stuff can be too. I don't even use pins most of the time. I'm just like, hey, let's see what happens. I can always rip it out, you know, but that's this how you end up chaos. putting on, how many sleeves have I put on inside out? I'm sure I do it at least once per project. I'm like, how is it? There's two sleeves. I managed to put them on inside out 50% of the time. So anyway, same. that's where so, pinning does come in handy. So yeah. How did you negotiate your relationship? Did you, did you lay out, I, I've seen laurels who actually write up a contract in period language and, and like rip it in half and give half to each person. Um, if people get really, really into uh, defining the, the, their relationship ahead of time. Um, how did you guys do that for yourself? I mean, that sounds really cool. Is that something you wish I had done? Cause we didn't talk about that. Uh, -uh that sounds like work. Yep. I gave them all some old necklaces I had. That was something. <laughs> and at one point, I God, I should have brought it upstairs with me. I made them these um, tumblers, these coffee tumblers that I printed, you know, it's the kind where you can put your own insert in. And I printed um, on my computer, this really cheesy graphic of, um, <laughs> My name is Heloisa de Frigiu, apprentice to Duchess Dagger, <laughs> O-L. And it had like flames and stuff on it. And then you okay. turn it around and it said, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> so that probably correctly frames for you, like what that was like. Um, so I, I guess, no, I mean, we like I said, each of us is different, you know, each relationship is different. My expectation with each of my apprentices is that we're going to be um, honest with each other and that we're going to, you know, uh, talk about problems that come up, but also that they will accept counsel from me. I don't, I mean, I can't even imagine being in an apprentice uh, relationship, a laurel relationship with somebody and they, they wouldn't accept my counsel because my time is really valuable. Hel Heloisa knows I'm, I, you know, my career has been super um, challenging at times and very busy and I have a kid on the autism spectrum and, you know, just all of that, it, you know, my time is really valuable and everybody's time is valuable, but my time, like, if I'm giving somebody a, the gift of my counsel and the gift of my help and they aren't taking it seriously, it's such a huge drain. It's very demoralizing. And I went through a lot of that before I was made a Laurel where people were like, especially when I first moved to the West, nobody was really doing a lot of Viking era stuff. And I didn't know what I was doing either. And thankfully had friends who helped me, but a lot of it, I just had to stumble through and kind of figure out on my own rectangular construction, all of that, where I just looked at stuff and tried to do it and got a lot wrong, but we also didn't have as much stuff then like the internet <laughs> was just barely on board so you know it was limited like you you had from viking to crusader and like one or two other books <clears throat> that you could get your hands on but it was challenging and so as a consequence i had to learn all of that the hard way and lots of people would want to come and learn and that's great but you can't just take knowledge from people and not give anything back. Even if that's just showing up, doing something with it, like actually use the knowledge and, and do something with it. Don't just use up somebody's time and don't do anything with that information. I don't know a single Laurel or any teacher in the SCA who would enjoy that feeling like you had just squandered that time with them. Um, uh, don't do me any favors. Don't. No. Don't, don't take my time as a favor to me. Do no, it's yeah. not, it's, it's really, it's really demoralizing when somebody who is really busy or who takes a lot of time to do things for other people and doesn't do things for themselves. There's so many of us. A lot of us are women. A lot of us are doing free labor, especially in the SCA with costuming and scribal and a lot of these things that are very women dominated. We're being asked to do a lot of free labor also not getting a lot of credit for it because it's not, you know, it's not considered, um, it's not valued. 
it's not valued, you know, because we undervalue things like clothing so much in our modern lives, you know, and are accustomed to having things done so cheaply. So that's a whole other topic that we could go down that rabbit hole, but, but don't, don't use my time and, and squander it by not using it and, uh, correctly. And that is probably with my apprentices, one of the most important things is like, come on, don't waste my time. Like I'm here for you. And when I am here for you, if I'm not here for you, that's a whole different <laughs> issue. But if right. I'm here for you, please don't waste my time. And I don't have that issue with my folks, but I, you know, I would find it frustrating if somebody was, was constantly starting things and not following through or um, asking for my advice a lot and then not using it. Um, I don't, I don't want to have a formal relationship with somebody who, who doesn't need me. Um, I think so, we both needed a lot of flexibility Yeah. that, you know, uh, for some people having a very um, laid out kind of, um, I don't like saying rigid because that has negative connotations and I don't want to put a negative spin on something. Maybe well-defined. Really well yeah, well-defined. Some mm -hmm. people really benefit from that in their relationships, but definitely I think we are of a same temperament where we need the flexibility for life to expand and shrink. And mm -hmm. in terms of our availability, our stresses, what's pulling at us. And so we're, you know, we're not consistently available. We don't have a, a life that is so structured that we can consistently be available in the same way over a long period of time. Right. 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 And, and I guess what I, what I'm, um, in order to model for other people, um, Oh no, we don't want to be role models for other people. Though. Well, no, but but um, <laughs> let let's say there's somebody out there who is thinking about approaching somebody and mm -hmm. is wanting, or just wants to understand, like what does it mean to be an apprentice? Mm -hmm. um, and we say, you know, it's different things for different people. Um, but did you sit down at some point and say, you know, what are your expectations in a student? What are your expectations in a Laurel? What are you looking for? What kind of guidance do you want? I mean, we must have, but we put it in a different way. Yeah. We talked about what do I need out of this relationship? What am I looking for in the Laurel, you know, for both of us? Mm -hmm. What, what is it that, that Dagmir wants out of having, out of investing in that relationship? And what is it that Heloisa wants out of out of investing in that relationship we we didn't talk about it in terms of expectations necessarily I mean, we got there eventually yeah but for us it was I think more important to talk about what am I looking to get so that we could assess we could self-assess can I deliver that and can I participate in that um and you know, Dagmar asked me a lot of really good questions and other people did too because I talked to a bunch of people about you know kind of asking well what is your experience what do you you know I talked to Laurel's what do you want out of your relationship with your apprentices. I talked to other apprentices. What do you, you know, what do you like out of being an apprentice to try to get a sense of what other people were looking for so I could hone in better on what I was looking for. But I think it's really important if you're thinking about being an apprentice, that you take the time to self-assess what is your artistic process. Mm -hmm. Are you in a position where you don't know what that is and you're looking for somebody to really shape you as an artist? Or are you somebody who has a pretty good sense of how you like to create what you need to be creative and what you're looking for is maybe something else like right. you know, navigating the, um, the kind of hierarchy of the SDA society mm -hmm. or other things like that. So and I would say a sense of who you are helps. I would say that's that last point is probably because of my particular experience uh, having reigned that's probably one of the strengths that I bring is that if um, I'm good at navigating stuff and I'm good at talking to people and trying to figure out answers to things or trying to work through thorny problems. And um, so I don't need to have an apprentice who's doing the same things I do. Um, in fact, that's kind of boring. I'd rather they do different things and they teach me um, because I don't, I don't consider that why I take an apprentice. I, I don't take apprentices who just want to do what I do. Um, most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm, I mean, I'm doing whatever. And I'm, I'm usually 
what makes what I do fun for me is that I don't understand it fully. I'm trying to understand it through doing it. And I would hate to feel like I had to teach somebody along that same process. It would, that would be very stifling for me to be like, oh, I'm learning how to paint right now, which is true. Um, and I'm going to teach someone as I'm like two chapters ahead in the book. Like that's not, you know, I don't want to do that. So, but what I am really good at is hey, I'm having this problem with this person there. They have a peer and that peer is local. And, you know, I'm feeling pressure to, you know, compromise what I think because this peer might know what I, you know, might have an opinion about it. And I can be like, you don't need to worry about that person. They're great. You should do what you need to do. Or yeah, that person can be difficult and that's okay. Like difficult people provide, you know, value to, they're just not necessarily doing it in a way that you get, that works for you, right. you know? So how can we like make that person feel like they're adding value for, to you as well? So that that's better, you know, like there, that's the kind of stuff I'm good at. And I'm good at like helping people word things, you know, that sort of thing. So, or find like plugging people into each other. So for me, the right apprentice is someone who wants those things the wrong apprentice would be somebody who wants like kind of sort of continuous um, holding supervision. Yeah, that's not a good idea. I barely supervise myself, <laughs> very barely. Um, so, you know, I thought maybe we could keep talking about this while we're looking at slides because we have so many of them and I don't want to run out of time. Is that okay? I'm going to share my screen, uh, folks. So do not blame a Shaxi if any of this gets messed up. I'm not really driving the bus today. <laughs> no. I asked Ashaxi, I'm like, do you want to run the slides? She's like, no, you go ahead. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah this is no. great. I don't need to control anything. I'm good. This is a this is a really funny photo because it looks so I look so straight. I don't know why I'm standing like that. It's really silly. <laughs> I'm sure someone was like, hold still, I want to take a photo. I'm like, okay. Fine. Okay. <laughs> But this was on the day of Heloise's elevation. And um, I, I have several photos in here of different outfits that I'm wearing where I wanna also make a nod to the fact that a lot of the clothes that I'm wearing were made for me. Um, I can sew for myself. I don't like to, um, I don't do, I did so much for so long that it's so such a pleasure to wear things that other people have made. And this was from our second reign. We did a lot of um, sort of Turkish and Persian inspired um, uh, clothes. And that was um, this particular outfit. M most of this was made for me by um, a team that Laurelin put together and um, include, including, let's see, both clothing layers. And then the shoes were made by Oktar. And then I made my coronet. Um, and of course, my entire outfit is like all group project. Yes, and we have lots of pictures of that, <laughs> but it's just such a great picture to see kind of the whole thing put together um, mm -hmm. from, from your elevation. Hey, um, as we go along though, really quick, um, Heloisa, can you talk about um, what your time period is? Yes, uh, I do 12th century. I really focus on 12th century, more, more towards the latter half than the, than the early half. Um, I got fascinated by the Leo and uh, trying to understand this garment and then uh, fell down the rabbit hole um, yeah. of all of 12th century. So this right. is a garment, this is a chance. The chance gets, um, is a very misunderstood garment. Because, you can talk about it for 20 seconds. Okay, uh, because people miss, people think that it's also the same word for a chemise, that it's always an underdress, but the chance and the chemise are different. Chemise is a body layer, chance is, an, is a completely, on its own standalone outer layer made yep. of washable linen. Yep, so. we have a whole bunch of other pictures of it, but also the reason I was telling you what to do because I like to is because, um, and also because um, anybody who wants to um, contact um, Heloisa about her Chance research, it's amazing. And you should just read her paper, look at her research. It's really, really cool and I encourage you to do that because we could talk about it for like hours. So this is a, the formal picture and this is what we're really like. This is totally, 
Uh, this appears to be, I don't know, in a vehicle. We're on our way to an event, I think. We're, that sounds we're right. Two are back from the September crown, I think. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is our apprentice Laurel relationship in a nutshell. So <laughs> we are goofballs. Hundred <laughs> percent. These um, are my other apprentices. Some of them. We have another slide, and so you can see on the left. Um, that's um, obviously Heloisa and me, and then that's on Harid down below, and then Celia is in the back, and she is late. She is no longer with us but I have a slide later, so I don't cry until then. And then in the other photo, that's an awesome picture of Nimue, um, who did, um, she did Florentine, really, really beautiful Florentine. And um, there's on Harid again. And then these pictures are of Nita, Rita Relli, and they're hilarious in part because um, she's hilarious. She's the, a lot of people um, know her because of her jester stuff, but she does a lot of other things too. Here's her hobby horse that she made before she moved to China, which is where she lives now, which is a tragedy for Ontario. And then is that the she, one that has the wine service. Yeah, it has um, Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> so good, you guys. She's so funny. And then um, she also took these this frame to vigils and people would take pictures of themselves in the on-tier vigil frame, which was such a cool, like it's one of her superpowers is icebreaker stuff. And she would get people to do this and then she would post them in an album of people in this vigil frame. And it was, so, it was genius because everybody looked decent in the vigil frame at vigils. And it, it was very community building. The big picture though, is when she and I went around at an event with a camera and did interviews with people. I'm holding a wooden spoon as a microphone and we did it like person on the street interviews. And then Atias edited them together and showed them on um, the hotel's closed circuit television station, whatever, at a 12th night. Um, so here we are, she's recording me and I'm on the camera with my wooden spoon interviewing people, asking them silly questions. I think that's Alfreda and Anne-Marie. That's, that looks right to me. And um, this is in the Ontario Royal Pavilion and it was hilarious and great fun and um, probably uh, prescient for our being, uh, doing, doing podcast <laughs> interviews or Facebook interviews later or so. This is Marika. She was elevated um, right before the world shut down. And um, I just thought this was a really picture, funny picture of her sticking her tongue out with a goat, uh, mm -hmm. stuffed goat that I have a bunch of pictures of people um, playing with. And then this is during her elevation um, when we're putting her mantle on her. And I have more pictures of that later too. Um, so she is an amazing bead maker and um, uh, just all around special human. So um, this slide really quickly, I included because Eleanor has um, a great family. There's a picture of your sister later, but I wanted to make sure we talked about your mom and what a cool lady she is and how often she has been involved in collaborations we've done. So chopping vegetables or doing whatever. I mean, she's just so, so lovely and willing to participate in stuff. So I wanted Full to call out you. how cool your mom is. Yeah. Yeah. She's, and she loves doing SCA with me and that I know not everybody has that kind of mom relationship. And I feel really, really blessed to have the relationship I do. Yeah. If you need and, mom, you can come see mine. That's right. And then I just thought that was a cute picture of you with my husband, my handsome husband down below. Um, but just talking about like the, the fact that we're able to do what we do depends on, a lot on these relationships that we have with people that may not be directly involved in the projects we're working on and how, how important that is that they give us kind of the space and grace to do things. So, um, and these are our, our inspirations, our direct inspirations. Um, I liked this picture of Michael because he's walking behind you. And I thought that was funny. <laughs> and he's hard to find pictures of. In it's true. Art. It's true. But this, he made a rare appearance at this event. Um, and then uh, the other picture, of course, is of my handsome husband and me trying to eat my child's head. And I thought that was funny. So that outfit. Okay. So his outfit was part of that rain where a lot of it was made by um, Laurelyn and her 
her her group and then i'm wearing um an outfit that the bulk of it was made by um celeste by a uh, hey, megan yes day megan and um all and some other like repurposed recycled stuff but the most of that you know they dyed the fabric she and kalja collaborated and you know, and megan did a bunch of beading and it's really gorgeous and i love it and and this is a really great view of um i've already forgotten the name of it but your elevation gown is just that's Absolutely. all hand smocked and it's just yep so and we, we we have photos of the smocking in progress so amazing yeah yeah i love oh, seeing how the sleeves fall in the pleats yeah i, I felt well i felt amazing <laughs> you know, yeah. to wear something like that it's, it's incredible it's very cool i would spill red wine down it even if i wasn't drinking it i would just spill somebody else's red wine down the front of it so and then i'd pour white wine over it and bleach it re-bleach it yeah mm, okay <laughs> I just love these pictures and included them because they're of my beautiful friend, Heloisa, who's also <laughs> just a fabulous goofball. And I love her playing with her sleeves, her fur lined sleeves, but also she was so proud. She found these aqua colored leather shoes. <laughs> I don't remember, did Michael make those? Michael the tall, somebody. Anyway, she found those shoes and she was so, so happy. Barefoot, I'm like, oh. barefoot cord wainer. Oh, there you go. I'm like, only you could be like that excited to wear aqua colored leather shoes but she... I don't know they're pretty exciting I think I would be doing that dance as well those are pretty spectacular it's also two great views of her blios though uh is the is the red one a blio is it made of silk I don't it's okay a wool okay. it's a it's a uh, a wool coat yeah I see I learn I do it's learn <laughs> the blio is not the cut it refers to the fabric it's made out of and I have to do a call out to um uh, Alessandra, um, uh, because I accidentally left those shoes in a plastic bag after an event and they got, after a wet event and they got moldy and, uh, she was very generous and was getting, was really getting into the, like learning how to care for leather and she saved my shoes. So Aww. thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Alessandra, because mistress uh, Alessandra. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh that was a tragedy i was like oh my god i've killed my shoes no <laughs> i learned something that new i did not know leo had to be silk that's really cool. it doesn't always have to be silk it did like towards the end of the period you do see some references to fine wool but it's just the blio the word started as a name for silk fabric and it was court wear that was almost always silk so yeah. like like kleenex you know the brand it's the kleenex <laughs> of the 12th century it's <laughs> awesome all right let's see what's next oh more pictures of my beautiful then apprentice from athenaeum on the left which is a cool event we have up here but let's not go too far into that because it's that could also fill up an hour but then your other really cool blio out of that amazing sartor fabric oh that fabric is just insanely good <laughs> It's so good. And I just all hand sewed it because it was so much fun to touch the fabric. I didn't even want to put it through a machine. I was just like, oh, I want to touch it as much as possible. But you learned a lot. And that's, see, again, the thing about Heloisa is she'll take the time to do the experimental archaeology. And so, you know, being challenged by that fabric meant doing a lot of, you know, piecing things and trying to figure out the, the, one of the things she specifically worked on was how to coordinate the direction of the sleeve and its placement on the arm so that the points are pointing actually downwards because you don't just go out from the shoulder and make a triangle down. You have yeah. to rotate it and, and do the two pieces differently to create that bell, which I didn't know until she started really looking into that. And again, I bet she would share her and you can even kind of thinking. see in the purple sartor fabric one at the elbow, what I do is I put a little um, diamond gusset in there mm -hmm. and it changes the whole thing. Like yeah. that was my, be all of these are different iterations of yeah. what I do is I play with a pattern, but I never just do it in the low stakes where I'll, I'll just do it out of a mock-up and then do the real thing. I mean, you know, I'll mock up a little bit and then I'll be like, 
I got it enough. And then I'll do it out of real fabric because I'm crazy. I but do. each one is a little different, you know? Yeah. But I didn't know anything about this time period. Didn't care about it. Wasn't super interested. But over time, after proofreading enough of your materials and <laughs> sitting in on your stuff, I learned a lot. So these are just great because it's so, these are so Heloisa. This, she's doing these largesse bags in the big photo and she has that big grin on her face because that is legitimately how she feels about doing stuff like that. True. Big and smile on her face. Bag I, I made for you. That was that's right. the same Sartor fabric and made a bag for Yep. yep. For and then you're teaching in one of your, in your older shants, your first shants. And then in this other photo um, with, uh, some other folks from up here, um, that's from uh, Ursulmus where they ran like a tailor shop to give advice to people on sewing. And so. Mistress Assault and Honor and I have done a lot. Yeah. They've been very involved in a lot of projects. Um, this is me. I just included pictures of me in different clothes that different people made. Again, um, these are all part of the geranimals sets that Laurelyn did for me where she coordinated, um, you know, we bought fabrics that worked well enough together that all of my pieces could be worn interchangeably. Um, I see beadwork that's done by Megan on each of these. Those little hats were really cool. And um, Dame Ellen from uh, Dragon's Lair did a bunch of those for me so that the crown could sit on something other than my head, which was causing um, migraines. In my first reign, it caused a lot of headaches for me. So she she made these for me um, to go with my different outfits. And it, it really, really helped a lot to have those to have those different pieces. And then I see also a necklace in the photo on the left that um, Mai made for me. Now a laurel in Avocal. And I think you put those earrings together for me, Ashaxi. Uh, probably. I also yeah. did the royal cloak behind you. <laughs> That's right. The royal cloaks made out of wool. So they don't tend to um, get worn a whole lot in the summer, but they are so gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous. You've done a ton of those. They good, they're good tapestries for <laughs> yeah. they good hanging on the thrones. <laughs> yep. Um, and then I included these because this is probably the outfit I get the most mileage out of. Um, we didn't have enough of it to do pattern matching because I just had a scrap from that amazing, like, I think it's Brytex down in um, San Francisco. I bought this, like, piece of it, like, the, all that I could afford. But I love this photo on the left because this is when we're making your sister a pelican in a horse barn. And she looks so happy about she it. She looks so, just thrilled. <laughs> and then... The other photo is from Penzik and um, this very nice man who I think has passed. So, and I don't remember his name. I'm very sorry. He was such a sweetheart. Um, I was on a cane for a lot of this rain and he took me around on this cart um, at night because I didn't want to navigate the uneven ground and wasn't going to be able to like go anywhere. And he, he was such a sweetheart, but I just love how jaunty I look in the back of this um cart in this outfit I love so much and you can also see our inspirational equality armband that we wore um, I have one of the banners here too those were done by Mistress Ariel because during that time we were that was when we were really advocating hard for inspirational equality which goes back by the way to values so one of the things that I of course am careful about is to talk with my people people whose reputation is are is bound to mine if I'm going to do something controversial I try to talk to them about it and while there should be nothing controversial about inspirational equality I did need to make sure they were all fully on board or that they had a graceful exit out of uh, our relationship if they weren't and of course it wasn't a problem but um that was really that was a huge deal to us during this reign um so this we can go to collaborative projects now. Um, I found some of our bags. <laughs> I, unfortunately, um, a few computers ago and before we were putting everything on the cloud, um, you, you know, I have to go find files and disks and hard drives to find old projects, which is unfortunate. But these, these were um, bags that we probably made for a Penzik back before they assigned a kingdom to each king in each kingdom to give to we we were giving gifts to every kingdom or they two pensics at least 
we did. Okay. So, so we just got, probably it happened, I think from my first reign where I was like, oh, largesse is a lot of work. We should be making this. So we started doing a lot of these kinds of projects where basically we would f- get a bunch of wool together, scraps, and then, um, you know, and this is al- almost always out of the artist's pocket, just to be sh- clear, because this is not something where there's usually a kingdom budget for it. But we would um, design, you know, we would do a few designs onto heat and bond and, and get, hand somebody the wool with either the design if they felt they could do it themselves, or we would cut the, cut the um, design out and, and give it to them like that. And then we would get it back embroidered. And this is of course, a thing that we do a lot up here in Ontario, but I, I didn't appreciate at the time that it wasn't done in every kingdom this way. Um, so we would send these off with the royalty to fill with gifts for, um, for largesse for different purposes. And usually the designs would match the, the rain. Did you do the horse there? I don't the- remember which one of these I did. I- you know, it's so funny because I was, it was so, it was so long ago and I was mm-hmm. so stressed out about learning. Yeah. Uh, so I couldn't tell you which one was mine. But um, this is how people learn. And this, yeah. so the reason I included this and we have other pictures like this is because a big part of what we need to do in the SCA, I really feel strongly about is give people relatively low stakes way to learn how to do things with guidance. And so this was one of those projects where we would send these out and then you always send out more than you plan on using because some of them would come back not really usable and that was okay Mm -hmm. some of them would come back and need some finishing or some work um so there's you know some of them wouldn't come back some of them wouldn't come back that's right though that was relatively unusual um but it would happen so um so I don't know who did each of these. The per- people um, might recognize their own work, but these were just some examples of, um, you know, and you can see like the lion, those two lions look very, very different based on the vision of the person who did it. Um, so we did tons of these. This was- Oh, sorry, can I add Go a ahead. little bit? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something that I think is so brilliant about those is not only are they great projects for people who are learning, but they're very compartmentalized. So yeah. each step, it's really easy to hand out like not the, the one person coordinating isn't is it's easy to to share the load and to and to give work out and not have one person doing you know gobs and gobs of work which is really it's cool. true though we did usually end up having to do all the finishing work on them and so there were people who didn't want to do embroidery but were like oh are we going to machine finish these great and it's like well half of them will be but then we would flip it and hand finish and you know, you'll notice like we didn't use woven bands for the straps at this point. There just weren't enough people doing weaving, you know, and that's a lot of work to ask somebody to do when you can just zip on a piece of fabric, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but we did a lot of these. We did one um, whole batch where they, instead of being like looking kind of pseudo Norse like this, there's no documentation for bags like this. I want to be really clear about that. They just looked cool. They look flash. Um, but we did um, a bunch where we used tile designs, like 14th century tiles. Those were really fun and they looked really flash. Again, there's no evidence that they would have existed, but they looked a little bit more period, a little bit more like reliquary bags, but always working in wool because people find it so forgiving. And um, a, an experienced person could probably finish one of these in a weekend for somebody less experienced or who, you know, doesn't have a ton of um, time, it might take longer. These were another early project. These are um, Thrones favors that I did for um, Skeggy and Tasia. And then that picture in the center, it was just cute because I actually received one of them. I'm like, you mean I could have done one fewer? Those were a lot of work, you, you guys. <laughs> I would have just not made mine. <laughs> so, but these were really cool and really different. Um, in, in Ontario, you know, someone at some point decided to start making really fancy Thrones favors and it's kind of a thing now, which is awesome. So it's really common to see people with these, um, with 
like little mini banners hanging in their camps if they've received one um, or two or five or 20, like a Shaxi. I don't even know how many you've gotten, but um, these were done. Uh, we made the checky because making on tier um, gold and white checky is something everybody has to do at some point. It's just part of being in on tier. And then this is just um, ultra suede, um, you know, heat and bonded onto the silk and then, um, and then at, you know, we sewed around it with like a tiny little like whip stitch or blanket stitch or something. So, but what this represents is several different skill sets that people could, if somebody wanted to make checky because their, you know, quilt making skills were on point, they could do that. If they wanted to just cut out fiddly, like um, heat and bond, you know, ultra suede designs, they could do that. Or if they wanted to do some embroidery, they could do that. And so um, again, not a period design. <laughs> we were just kind of making it up, but I think it looks like, it's I mean, kind of Scythian. And then we use horsetail for the, um, the tassels. So we just wanted something that looked a little different. So it, they look really cool. Um, then things progressed and a chat, uh, um, Heloisa and I, like dumbasses, decided. Oh, madness. madness. Were these for Trimeris? Do you remember? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we were sending these with Dalla, I think. Yes. Is that right? I think that's so, right. So we just needed one for each, you know, we just needed two, a set of two, basically. And so we decided to do these are like oversized reliquary bags. And so we were like, well, let's do like, we don't. We could do like fake gold work and do a bunch of beading and do these fucking bags took forever. They took oh way too God. long. But the cool thing was, if you look in the picture on the lower left, you'll see that there's a pattern already marked out. That's fabric we bought that way. Oh, it that's like cool. a. It was yeah. It was a decorator fabric that was embroidered with this design, and we were like, oh my God, that's like half the work right there is the outline for all of these elements. And so we took that and then you'll see each of us, we decided to do it so that we were filling in different squares so that it they looked a little different from each other. They don't match perfectly because then it doesn't matter yeah. if they don't match perfectly, so. But they're nice companion pieces. Yeah, that's, that's and, what we thought too. I'll, I'll tell you, um, I've done a fair amount of these bags as well. And one of the most awesome moments in doing these interviews was we were interviewing, um, oh my God, I'm gonna to totally blank out on his name. Oh, how embarrassing. Um, anyway, we were interviewing, um, it was one of Misty's Ducal interviews. And as we're going along, he's talking about raining. And I was like, and I'm looking at his, his arms and I'm thinking about where he reigned. And I was like, did you at one point receive a, a largesse bag with a Medusa embroidered on it? And his face lit up and he's like, I did. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. And he ran and he got it. <laughs> and th that was like, I don't know, 12 years ago. Oh, that was so long ago. I think it was before Molly was born. That's so cool because we have no idea who received these, right? And have no idea if they like them, right? And they were a lot of work. Yep, a lot, a lot of work. Um, I also call out that a soul did the cording for them, um, and then we bought those are store bought tassels. But then we put the coins from the from Dalla and I want to say it's not Severus. <laughs> <laughs> Severus. Oh, Sorry. I'm calling him Severus Snape from now on. I wanted to call him. He's like the most unseverous Snape person ever. <laughs> anyway, we put their coins on the on the bag, um, so that would be kind of the piece from Ontario that kind of showed where it came from. But these were a lot of fun and a, a really a lot of work, and they were literally done at the last minute. Oh, there's a the theme here. Minute. The theme is staying up all night before delivery it's really I mean, dumb it's really it, it's so it's so dumb but like that's what happened here is yeah i just keep doing it i delivered them to the person who was taking them to the event where they were going to be given away uh they were taking an early flight and i was doing 
last, like last minute construction finishing on the insides. And, and I was just like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to stay up. I'm just going to do it. And I was doing that until like pushing the limits of, okay, it's a, I have to drive uh, 40 minutes to the location where I'm dropping them off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have 40 minutes. Exactly. Okay. My husband here's and I the, run to the car and he drives. But here's a really cool thing about these. Um, the one on the far right is, is um, Heloisa's um in not the not the big photo but the one in the close-up and the close-up on the left is mine and what's cool is you can see how similar our work is and that that is a thing you know we have calibrated against each other for a long time and so as we've as we do these things and we work on things you know our standards match and that really, really helps when you have a collaborative partner is to know, oh, if I hand this to her, it's going to come out the way I need it yeah. to. Yeah. You know? um, Helga was that person for me. Oh, uh, yeah. She, she did as much of the handwork on those kingdom cloaks as I did. Yeah. And um, you can't tell which is hers and which is No, hers. she did a, one of my underdresses. She did all the hand finishing on the seams. Oh, by the way that's really where you learn how to hand sew is doing hand finishing the insides of garments. It's never going to yeah. show, but I can tell you the garments that I have that were hand finished on the inside are never going to fall apart. They are, they are rock solid. It really, really does make a difference over surging or whatever. Yeah. And um, that's one of the things um, when I do group costuming for rains, uh, we do kits, we do garment yeah. kits. Yeah. And um, I do a sample in the armpit of how things need to be finished and then farm it out. And some of those don't ever come back. Some of them come back years later. Yeah. Um, some of them come back and they're sewn complete. I had one garment come back and it was sewn completely wrong and it had been bled all over. <laughs> and I washed it and I took out what was wrong and I fixed it. And, but, you know, I mean, you, you have to approach these kind of group problems with yeah. group projects problems with the attitude that um i'm grateful for whatever work people do yeah and I, I i i budget the time so that i have time to redo the whole garment if i need to yep 98 percent of the time that doesn't happen um but it gives people such an opportunity to you know the the joy of seeing a royal in something you made mm -hmm. is so awesome and to be able to give that to other people um right anyway yeah. sorry i'm hijacking no that's fine and, and we have some pictures of some of the stuff we've worked on this these are just photos the uh process and and kind of end photo of um the mantle that we did for heloisa's elevation um Fucking I, glorious it i is just i just thought it was fun to kind fun. of show the cheap bits that i bought and then put together to make something less I mean, probably equally cheap looking if you look at it really close, but I'm not a jeweler, nor could I afford real stones most of the time, that sort of thing. So I was kind of trying to get the effect of what we were going for without um, the budget for it and um, by just making it as lush as possible. And um, everything on here was just findings that were assembled. Um, I did um, custom order the laurel, um, the enameled pieces. Um, those are something that I actually ordered and paid for. Um, and I got a little bit of help um, from um, Gazelle um, on some of the, um, around those laurels, the, she did some of the wire on those for me, which was really helpful because my hands were pretty trashed from this. But no, there's no evidence of giant mounds of turquoise glass beads, you know, or any of like that stuff, but it, but it's the essence of it is what I was going for. So that when you look at it in, in place, it looks right. Then around the hem of it, we did this painted, um, this is an Aesop's fable about the crow and the fox and the cheese. Basically it's a, a story about hubris because the fox wants the crow's cheese and so it flatters the crow into singing and the crow dropped the cheese and the fox takes it. And so it was an 
uh, admonition, I guess, to, to not allow yourself to be falsely flattered, um, which I thought was super awesome to go on a laurel cloak. So um, the lettering, I had never painted letters on silk. I had this like $30 a yard silk that I was painting on. It was terrifying. I, I was like, should I use a stencil? What should I do? And I got out my handy chalk pencil and wrote it on there and it looked just fine. I, I had a little help, you know, trying to find the font. I bought a book of Aesop fables in French from the time period to get the right phrase out. And it was a lot of work, but I got to tell you, it looked badass. And I did get, um, let's see, this is the finished mantle. Um, so the fabric and the lining, the fabric is a sartor silk and then the lining is a wool. And actually Heloisa, I had her cut those out. She, it's, she had the fabric. I think I had the wool. Yeah, she, and she wool. cut them out and did the basic construction on her body. So, and then I marked where the stuff needed to go, where the tassels, the brooches would go. And then I took it and she didn't see it again until um, oh. it was finished. I nearly broke down and cried when you pulled that out. And I saw it's it. pretty over the top. And oh. was the, I spilled those little beads all over the hardwood floor repeatedly and I still find them. Because oh I clumsy. And um, anyway, it turned out really, really well. So, um, you know, I had help from the sold. I had help from... Um, um, uh, oh my gosh. Ugh, I'm so bad with names. The two ladies who are up in, um, in Aquaterra. Oh, uh, yes. I, I always get Lori's name wrong. I know. Margo and um, it's not Lucrezia. It's Lucrezia. Um, anyway, so sorry. Lori, lady. I'm sorry. It was Lori. They was... helped with some of the long like edging and sewing of the long bits. And, you know, so I had, I had some help, but I also, late at night was working on it a lot and didn't, you know, it wasn't super coordinated, but it turned out really beautifully. Um, and so here she is ha wearing it and it being presented in court. And it just, it just looks, it looks so good. And then um, she had a, we have the enameled um, laurels where the tassels go. Um, one of them was donated by Martin La Harper and it needed a little repair work. And, and we had the other one commissioned from Fjordleaf. Um, so this is another outfit we worked on um, that I will never, ever, ever, ever do one of these again. Um, and I didn't even do most of the work on it. I did the bead work around her neckline. I did some handwork and I did the edging on her undergarment. But most of this was a sold and Heloisa at Heloisa's house. But it's the fur around this hemline that really broke us and it, I mean, and also this was a project where somebody else had, it was somebody else's design. It was um, a Charles de Bourbon's um, design and they provided the fabric and then we did the construction, which isn't ideal because, you know, the fittings and that sort of thing, it, it was just a little complex because we weren't working with our own design, but it's three garments, the undergarment, the, the um kirtle and then the um gothic fitted dress the dress from hell is what we called it and that is not yeah. a comment about mary grace we love you your grace but we kind of called it the gothalon because it's kind of a combination between a gothic of like a dress yeah and... it's that kind of intermediary yeah. it looks amazing she wears it still which is also great if you're going to make clothes for royals and they only wear them once it is really demoralizing yep. um and so, um, you know, it's, it's good to get it right. Um, so anyway, that, that, that dress taught us a lot about time management and I had a bunch of work life stuff happen. So, um, but it, you know, we couldn't not finish things by hand. We couldn't just throw it on a machine, even though you know, it's like, oh, it won't matter. It's like, yeah, it does matter. Like it has to be right. And um, sometimes we don't need to have everything right. That is a thing. We could have just glued that fur on. It would have actually been period to do that. Yep. So, but we didn't. So, but it's beautiful. It's made very well. 
It's gorgeous. And it provided an opportunity for Isolde and I to bond quite heartily because she was at my house constantly. And that is the thing too, like, you know, at the time, um, so I've spent most of the last uh, 10 plus years working for myself and uh, in a small business that didn't demand a lot of my time. So yeah. I did have a lot of time to put into it. And, right. um, and so I was really glad to, to, to have that and to be able to just be like, you know what, I'm just going to drop everything that isn't essential. And this is what I'm doing right now until it's right. done. Right. And but I, but I didn't have that. So right, exactly. I, I yeah. worked regular hours and had a child. So I don't even want to estimate how long this outfit took. <laughs> no. I mean, it was, it was probably a full-time job for, for two people for th maybe three weeks. And again, this isn't a slight to the recipients. SCA is full of a lot of unpaid labor and we, we have expectations of people. Is there I mean, show me someone who is a pelican right now who, who would disagree that, th that having a full-time SCA job for three weeks stretched over three years, you know, wouldn't be worthy of some kind of recognition for service. Like we, we tend to put the arts into this other category that, that you know, that there's some satisfaction that people are getting out of it that's intrinsic to creating that that takes away from the fact that it's also service. And um, I think that that's a problem, you know. In, and not in just service idea. to the individuals who receive it, but service to the SCA. Yeah. Because we yeah. want our laurels to look, we want our uh, royals to look amazing. You know, we right. want them to feel right. royal. And, and so, I'm not saying that for myself. I'm saying I see a lot of this kind of stuff where people donate huge amounts of their time. And, you know, even people who are being, who have already been recognized as a Laurel, when you put that kind of time into service, when there's a, plenty of people who don't, you know, but we, again, because it's art, we tend to go, oh, well, it's, that's intrinsic to being an artist. Yeah. It's Laurel service. And it's like, no, it's yeah. above and beyond. Um, it is. It is it's above and beyond. Yep. So the, um, the tribal work that people do, the um, the lamp workers guild, and all I mean the thousands of beads they've made, and the hundreds of, of sets of royalty that they've given away, full you know like a, a necklace for every kingdom, right? Rain after rain after rain after rain after rain. Right. And and, and as you said, the materials often out of our own pocket. Often, I yeah. provided that the green fabric for the underdress and the silk trim that got beaded. That was from my yep. stash and right. things like that, you know, happen where you're right. like, well, we need to make this project happen. Right. What do we have to use in our stash? That's right. So, and I, and I, you know, it's, it is when people are genuinely appreciative and Mary Grace wearing it, it is. make is like, that is the most important thing. Yep. Um, uh, but we also need to really recognize in the SCA how much we sort of ask people to do the way we ask them to spend their time in service to a set of standards that um, does not, it's not equitable, not everybody can do it. Um, and we do need to be really conscientious about that, that, that what people are able to give of themselves um, and what it takes to become truly proficient or truly excellent at something does not cost everybody the same. Yep. Um, these are just some fun things where um, when we were talking earlier about low stakes way to get people involved, the thing on the left is not an SCA thing, but in Ontario, we have a culture of doing baby quilts and, and other collaborative projects where each, you know, people make squares to do hangings and stuff. So this is something we did for um, Turi, Marcella, before she moved to um, England. And um, so everybody did a square. Well, this is a really good way to find out kind of where somebody's skill set is. How well do they follow directions? How well do they execute on something? You know, and for some people, they'd never done anything like this before. So it's, it's really cool where someone's like, oh, I don't know if I would do this the same way again. And it's like, that's really important. That's really cool that you know that. But also, it's such a lovely piece when you put it all together like this. Like it, it was such a delight to do. And um, 
the the creativity that people bring to stuff like this so mm -hmm. I will take something like this and then later go, oh, I know this person can do really good handwork. This person seems to only do stuff on machine. Let maybe machine work would be good for them. This person hated every minute of this and we should not ask them to do this again. Like they, they really despised everything about it and just did it out of love. Noted, you know, there's all the, those types. And then these little bags that um, Heloisa was making for large like prizes for things. Um, they're so fast and easy to make. Yeah. These, this was for a quilt. Now I have to confess it's a quilt that I was responsible for finishing, but I had so many people like trail in that by the time I got all the quilt squares back, um, I didn't have life anymore space to do it and didn't get it done and had to give it back to somebody else to do. But these were um, squares people did based on children's books. Um, Rifkin's is up in the corner here and Elizabeth did this one, I think, and um, Zoe did this one. And, you know, it was a really cool project. But again, it gives you a really clear idea of what kind of handwork people like to do and why. Um, this is your chance. We're going to run out of time. So I'm sorry if I'm kind of. I am not a, a time limit person with these inter interviews. Okay. If you guys have time restrictions, I respect and honor just, that. But, just my bladder. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there's three of us. So one, that's true. One, you know, we can yes. take shifts. Okay, so this is this is your amazing shots. What do you want to talk about the uh, smocking? Yeah. Uh, so the gold work, um, Mistress of Soul did, and um, and I really wanted to have gold work design on it, and uh, and I just she did a great job with and the beads, the little bead clusters too. The smocking, I I had a lot of help. I had um, my set, my third mom, Cheryl, stayed with me for a while, like a I think it was a week before the elevation and she did a bunch of smocking because it was all like there was a front panel two back panels two sleeves um and all of that had to be smocked so it was actually pretty easy to give a piece to different people nicklin who um mistress nicklin who recently was elevated um to the order of the laurel uh she did like this perfect back panel i mean you can if you look at the two pieces together you can kind of see her just absolute perfection next to a little bit more, you know, kind of loosey goosey, but still great. Um, I, I love that. I love that I can see the imprint of the different people who have, who've contributed, but honeycomb smocking is my, what I interpret a lot of the um, sculptures from the, uh, the, from the various kind of like Notre Dame cathedrals from the 12th century, where you see this honeycomb pattern that's um, on the, on the, sometimes just the tummy, sometimes the whole torso, sometimes the upper arm. And I think I, my personal take is they're depicting a chance, not a blio. Mm -hmm. And that, that honeycomb smocking is so, works so well in linen. And there are uh, several extant examples of smocking done on boars in, in uh, liturgical garments from the time. So it's not like smocking wasn't a known thing. Um, and there's a, there's some tricks to doing it pretty fast, um, but it's miles. I mean, this was miles of freaking smocking mm -hmm. and I had to like mark out, mark it all out, um, get all the little dots in the right in line with the grain of the fabric and, uh, and then handed off, handed a lot, as much of it off as I could and, and did a bunch of it myself. In, it was, right, but it fits great. It's, it's I'm wonderful. thinking about though the dress, pro the green dress project helped you establish trust and a sense of how well Nicolin would be able to do this work, you know, and Absolutely. other things too. But it's like each of these projects can layer into something higher stakes later when you are like, oh, I'm on a deadline, I need this done by this date. That's this yes. is somebody that can definitely do that. Or if they can't, we'll say something if they get stuck or aren't going to get it done in time, which is like that's so yes. important yes. like this was not a work with somebody new project this was yeah, right. everybody i everybody i got help from was somebody i'd worked with before and where i really knew what they could do and i could trust them to do it yeah. and mm -hmm. i think i think that 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 piece that you just talked about of uh, uh, somebody that can recognize oh i'm not going to finish this i have run out of capacity and can say I can't do this and bring it back. That's so important. It's so much better than hanging on and, and waiting and waiting and waiting. Just admit and, you know, 
no big deal. Yep. Life happens yep. and, and life is always more important than these projects. Always. Yep. Always. Yep. Always. Yep. Yep. So I liked these because it just shows kind of in situ, but also I love how, you know, you very clearly are wearing a chemise under your shants. <laughs> they are two separate garments and the side lacing is very cool. Yeah, that, that it's all hidden lacing. And I actually loaned this garment out to, uh, to Livia when she was queen and was going to an event where they were doing a hero themed court. And so uh, I said, you know, um, Princess Leia in a chance would be kind of amazing. And she was all over that. So oh. <laughs> that was a heck of a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And there's the back. It yeah. just looks so cool. So you can see the one on, I think the one on the left is the just like, no, the one on the right is the perfect one. And the one on the mm -hmm. left is a little bit more uh, uneven, but that's, I like that. I like that you have to look really close and I can go, oh, there's Nicolin's panel. Well, Thank and also, Nicholas. and the corded neckline in the chemise is also a cool thing that you did. Yeah, the, the, um, the Trapunto mm -hmm. uh, cord quilted neckline. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really cool. And then Never here you are with your beautiful sister and, and also now you can see it as you're walking into court. Yeah. Best Very sister cool. ever. <laughs> and so here, here's a blio you did for Helene. Mm -hmm. It was, it's, I can't find any of the pictures that I took of the final garment with uh, His Majesty Christian in it. But the um, black garment on the right is the, the pair to, to um, Her Majesty's. They wanted to have 12, a matching set of 12th century outfits, but not be overly matchy-matchy. And this was a lot of fun. It started out with no deadline. So right. from, a, from a collaborative project perspective, it was a learning experience because it was, I just wanted to make 12th century stuff. I wanted to make a 12th century thing for them. I thought Christian would look incredible in a fitted 12th century man's blio because you just don't see them very often i really wanted to make one and you can't tell in this picture but there are front slits a front slit and a back slit that go pretty high up so the blue lining flashes out when he moves and the sleeves are also have this really fun drapey bit at the end it's very very 12th century and uh, they looked incredible but I got a lot of help on the beading. You know, it, it, it is, a, it is um, easy oh to underestimate God. how much time beading takes. And then we sewed the beading on, hand sewed it onto those red strips, which were handmade, and then sewed all of that onto the garments. I, I mean, memories this... of Mistress of Sold at my house, just literally holding onto a piece that she was beading and falling asleep, <laughs> waking up and sewing some more. <laughs> As we were so tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, everything last minute, last minute, last minute, last minute. We got an Airbnb for this event. And basically, we're, as we were checking out of the Airbnb, we're like, how many of these silk threads do you think we have to pull out of the, the carpet? And what do you think they're going to be able to vacuum up? Because it's <laughs> such we a were mess. Constructing it. We were finishing the construction of like adding the sleeves to, you see, the dress has no sleeves in the far right picture. That's how it went to the uh that's how it went to the site and we sewed them on at site <laughs> i know so stupid but but learning experiences yep. so uh and here's and then right after that i had two things piled back to back because like i said i didn't we didn't have a deadline when we started the christian and helen project but then they really wanted to to have them for 12th night and i really wanted to deliver by 12th night so my vision had been this really expansive I have all the time in the world I'm going to do this really great thing with all this elaborate beading and then I had to like get lots of help and uh, in the compressed timeline but then immediately after there was no rest there was on Harid and Bryson's step down outfit and again man the strumpets Lori and Margot's crew uh, really came through for me and um, yeah. you know and on Harid herself and on Harid was an absolute joy to work with um she made, she made decisions decisively and quickly, which is so nice when you're doing a project for another person for them to do their part because it is really hard when you're working 
to, to do a project for somebody else and they cause it to be a compressed timeline because they're not making decisions that need to be made so you can start work and um, and that happens but on hard was all over it and um, she picked the fabrics and Virgo yeah it was, it was Virgo. great it was great here's and some close-ups a whole bunch of people just add the beads and mm -hmm. help out I think I did some of that beading and you did the neckline Dagmar you uh, did the right. fiddly attaching of that of the necklines that's right and then this was also collaborative. These are all collaborative projects. That's where they're on here. We're not just showing off our stuff. It's like, <laughs> these are uh, things that people work. worked on. Yeah. 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 And this was uh, Leith's um, elevation outfit for knighthood. And um, so that was really special. And his persona is um, Iron Age Irish. And um, so we wanted to use the designs from, like all the designs actually come from extant pieces from finds in the same time period and place range. Um, and then I just took designs off of pottery or things like, you know, um, uh, knife uh, scabbards, that kind of stuff, and then interpret it as embroidery. And um, Becca, uh, sorry, Anor and Eloise up in Aquaterra did uh, the bulk of the gold work on the trim for the borders and filling in with the silk. Um, uh, Dagmar did the, uh, the attaching the decorative green edging on the uh, on the swirls, on the white swirls. Like uh, I had a lot of help. And it's nice to have these pieces, these embroidered bands that just go out to different people and then just come back when they're done. Yeah. And this is for somebody that's not in the SCA anymore, but um, this was a, a story that a bunch this of people did first, panels on. Yeah. Yeah. It was my first ever, like, I'm in charge of this collaborative project. I was so intimidated. But every single one of those uh, little squares with a design on them all went out to a different person. I think that there were 14. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of people yeah. who were generous, like, people I'd never met. I just did call outs on to, like, barony pages. Can, who, Will anybody help with this project? And people just did. And their work was fantastic. Um, and so it's all, it all tells a story and then just came back together. Um, I, again, stayed up all, all the night before delivery. There were still two squares that had to be sewn on when I got on site. So I got on site with this cloak and laid it down on a table. Like I had told people ahead of time, I'm coming in and please help me get this this last two squares sewn down. I think it's those two that are that you can see on the far right. And people just swooped around and every, and I had like four people just sewing it. It was awesome. And I, I barely stayed awake and functional for the ceremony. And then I just slept for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, so this is a current project. Um, and I say that only because I haven't quite finished it. I need to do some editing on it because some things have changed since it was first created. But this was, um, is the scroll for Marika's um, elevation. Um, the collaborative pieces were in the construction. Um, Reagan Leaf put a lot of the stuff actually together, which was great because my hands were pretty trashed. I learned to paint to do this. So that was kind of fun. I hadn't worked with fabric and I hadn't painted before. And you can don't, please don't look at my calligraphy. It is not great. And I, but that is not, it's a labor of love, not a labor of a master calligrapher. But um, so I painted the, these panels, which sit down the front onto silk. And then um, Kalja did the weaving that's around the bottom of it. And it, which is pretty extraordinary. And when we're done, I can show you some of the other pieces because I have it sitting here with me. But as soon as I finish this, um, it'll go to Marika again. Um, but she doesn't have it yet. So, but this was a pretty fun uh, thing to work on. And my hubris did not keep me from thinking I could paint a scroll. So that was, that was good. I learned that I have a skill. And, and your painting has just come along. It just blows me away because it's something that I've always found so intimidating and you're doing such beautiful work. It's, it's really cool. That's lovely of you to say so. Thank you. Um, 
this is another collaborative project I work on. And I just to bring down the tone a little bit, um, the riderless horse is something that we created in Ontier um, that was um, an intentional collaboration between the um, consorts of Ontier, the um, um, uh, the roses and the um, and the um, Valorous estate. Um, to be stewards of a memorial project, basically in concert with the um, equestrian community. And so uh, we took the old champion's cloak, um, which has questionable things in it. Um, we, we washed it, which was super gross. And then we um, laid it out on the floor and we had to do some repair work. Um, but it was cool to use an old piece of kingdom regalia that was so recognizable and we turned it into this um, caparison, I think I'm saying it right, um, for the riderless horse. And so, and then the tassels are made by different people, mostly members of our group. And um, when someone passes, we um, attach a tassel in their name to this um, to this piece of regalia and then it's it's maintained and the ceremony is conducted by our order and um, as a piece of our own court business and each year we have a equestrian championship at our September crown and that's when the names are added so but that was a very important and very deliberate um, collaboration um, and something that's really important to me um, speaking of passings, this is Celia. She was my first apprentice. This is not from an SCA event. This is her cooking Thanksgiving dinner. And she died a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, we don't know. They, they said it wasn't COVID, but now that we know that COVID was around a little earlier, she died early, um, early in the year um, of a sudden illness. And um, so we lost her really fast and really too soon and we miss her a lot. Her laugh was just like the best thing in the world. Um, so I just wanted to have a, a picture of her that is just one of my favorite pictures of her because she just looks happy and um, she loved Bardic and loved singing and loved doing handwork and um, was always game to help with a project as she could and um, we miss her a lot. So, and then this is from Cheese Night. So uh, this is, I think our last photo. Um, I wanted to include this because um, one of the things that we did, and it wasn't really a function of our Laurel Apprentice relationship so much as just friendships. Um, I started um, hosting a craft night, but we ended up like always putting together a cheese board and spending more time eating cheese than actually doing crafts. And so we started calling it Cheese Night. So this is from Cheese Night. But more importantly, that's when a lot of these big group projects were worked on. So um, in 2003, I think that's right, um, was the first time we did a war cloak um, that was given out at Ontario West War. And that was something that um, was created, I guess I can just say that was my idea. Um, it was um, because there had been a war where there had been some bad blood between our kingdoms, Ontario and the West, and that was really dumb because we're like practically the same in so many ways, and it was unnecessary. And there was just, there's so much more camaraderie than there is um, um, anything else. And so, um, the idea was that whoever the hosting kingdom is that year would give a cloak honoring a war leader from the uh, uh, other kingdom's army. And so um, we made the, some of the first projects we worked on were war cloaks that were given out at Ontario West War um, the, in those first few years. And, and it um, was 2003 because I was pregnant with Sam. The first there you go. cloak that we worked on. Well, I made the first one and the idea had been that we would work on it on site and finish it on site. It was supposed to be collaborative. That turned into a nightmare because it's really hard to know just how much to have done up to the point you get on site and then guaranteeing there will be people around to work on it. Turned out not to be such a good idea. I probably <laughs> overestimated um, how much time we would want to be spending at the war um, 
working on a wool cloak too. So, um, so I did the first one, which was given by the West to Ontier. And then the next year I did the one that was given from Ontier to the West. And I did one or two more. I know that um, Duchess Miranda has done a huge number of them. I, I, don't, I don't even know how many, but um, those cloaks were collaborative too. And I wish I had some photos of them, but it's just right before the cloud. So I couldn't, I couldn't easily put my hands on them. But again, lots of um, yellow and white checky went into those. We pieced yellow and white wool checky on the edge of one of those. Oh my God, you guys, no, never again. <laughs> you need to um, own your hand sewing skills. You really, do yeah. Done checky. Oh. You really do. So, um, but that was, those collaborative projects though mean every person can contribute according to their ability, their time, their you know capacity um, in, to learn a new skill at that time. Like it's a really, humane way to learn how to do things in the SCA. And I, I really treasure the times that we got to do those projects. They, they were so important and they were great service. And I think people learned some skills that probably held, held them in good stead for their time in the SCA. For sure. For sure. So, um, Dagmar, we talked a little bit about what you're doing now. You're, you've been doing some painting and you've been doing interviews. Um, Eloisa, what have you, um, what is your uh, passion right now, SCA wise? What are you um, focused on? Well, it's, it's kind of funny that uh, once I got, once I had my elevation ceremony and I had kind of, my focus had been prior to that very much. Um, 12th century, making things for myself, making royal garb, or, you know, making, making where, what is an opportunity to do 12th century? And that's pretty much what I, where my focus was. And, um, and I felt free to shift my focus into other things. And so I ended up in this, honestly, it's another sort of side of collaborative because this is not something I'm doing all on my own. Um, there are, uh, there are people in the SCA, some, there's a family that I'm really close with and uh, they have two kids that have grown up in the SCA and, um, and they are you know, non-binary, they, them, adults now. And uh, being in the SCA um, you know, has its own challenges, both when you're known uh, as, as one specific gender your whole time and from a kid mm -hmm. and everybody kind of has their perceptions of you. And I, I just, I think I just started shifting my focus from what do I need to what do people need around me? And um, my passion right now is actually um, gender affirming uh, undergarments to help people who don't naturally have the silhouette that signals the gender of their preference, signal the gender of their preference and have more freedom to pick a time period of clothing. So I get really tired of trans people, non-binary people being told, well, you know, this one time period will allow you to hide your figure so that you can more easily maybe signal what you want. And I'm trying to find ways to apply, I actually started out with 14th century fitted kirtle structure to uh, adjust that into something that could um, help people achieve what they want. And, um, and it's been really successful, but this has been a very strong collaboration with Shay. And, um, you know, I could not have explored it without Shay trusting me enough to do fittings and discuss it in a, you know, in a really intimate way. And, um, and I feel like uh, it's not just my project. And, you know, with the pandemic and life happening and me having to move away, it's been um, a little bit hard. Like I'm kind of, I kind of had to put it all on hold and now I'm starting to gear it back up. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where my passion is right now is actually, it's not strictly historically accurate SCA clothing. It's what is, how do I help people who aren't having the experience they want in the SCA have an experience that's going to help them um, you know, be who they want to be and love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, 
one of the things that's always been really important to me in making clothing for other people is um, helping them to feel beautiful or handsome um, and comfortable in what they're wearing and being able to express who they are with what they're wearing. And um, I think that what you're doing is a really huge service. Thank you. I'm trying to find people I can share it with and teach them how to do it, which I've actually found um, a community here in Ottenvelt that I think is going to be a really strong community for me to help develop it and spread it around. And, you know, when I have something that's actually a more, um, you know, I just, I just want to share it with as many people in terms of teaching them how to do it. And I think anybody who's familiar with um, draping a body block and 14th century clothing could I could teach them very quickly how to how to do this so yeah. that's well yeah. when you get to that point I would definitely be interested in um, learning about what you're doing um, so that I could help because it's one of the things um, you know as as we're as we've been on this break we've talked a lot about um, being inclusive and being approachable by uh, other people, you know, new people to the SCA. Um, and I think that we also need to talk about retaining the people that are already here. And there are a lot of families in the SCA who have children that are going through exploration of their gender and uh, finding out who they are. And it's so important that we honor that and that we use the names and the pronouns that they prefer oh god yeah and uh, and from the perspective too one of the things i had no idea i mean i i was i grew up queer i had a lot of awkwardness you would never know from how femme i present now but as a as a young person i was mistaken for a boy all the time i didn't feel like i belonged in any you know i felt very kind of fluid i was like I don't really have a gender. I don't care. And, um, and so I feel very personally connected to that experience. And, but what I didn't know is, um, you know, I learned from Shay and from their experience helping out trans youth, uh, volunteering for a trans, tra an organization that helps trans youth that are like homeless and struggling. And that sometimes people, that you can only wear a breast binder for so long mm -hmm. before it has, has potentially does damage. And so my goal was, well, there's got to be a way to help people, you know, we do, we, we use clothing to change silhouette all the time. I mean, it's been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. There has to be a way that doesn't just, that isn't just compression, you know? And so my, my goal is to create something that doesn't have the dangers. And because when you're at an event, like you're, you're in these clothes in a situation where you're going to be seen for a lot longer than it's safe to bind. And so that was kind of where it came from. I it, think just, there's, there's that. And I think also we shouldn't overlook the fact that sometimes people choose, um, choose to use language about themselves that we don't understand. Um, but if it is affirming for them, it's identity affirming and the act of sewing for someone, it's not just the construction, it's the, you know, don't, don't say to someone who does not identify as femme, you should talk about their chest, not their breasts. You should talk about their, their torso, you know, you should talk about the shape and what they're going for, um, and try to use words that are that can allow them to step in and let you know what their preferred words are and what their preferred um, languages and and even in the way we touch people you know um it's you know we would of course approach somebody that we knew identified as a woman and say is it okay if i touch your your breasts as i'm doing whatever we should be doing the same thing for people who present as male is it okay if i if i touch your chest while i'm doing this it it's not if we can, if we can layer this kind of, like, can someone consent to the way I need to talk about them and talk with them about clothing their bodies? And can we have a conversation without it being, you know, 
um, defeating or deflating about how somebody would like to be talked about. The reality is for anyone who's nervous about that, asking the question, I, I, it would be helpful to me to know how to talk about your body in ways that are affirming for you. You can say that to somebody just like that. And they are going to say, oh, I'm so glad you asked. And this is what the language I prefer. And then if you slip and you're like, I heard you say that you prefer this, I'm sorry. Like that's, it's lovely. It's so good and it's so healthy to, for someone to see, like if you are struggling, that you're genuinely trying. And anyway, yeah. I mean, that goes for everything, not just for the project that Heloise is doing, but you know, I see this sometimes in the way we talk about um, men and women who are fighters, that we, we talk about the sensitivities around the way women are treated as fighters, but the reality is what women need as fighters, actually a lot of people who are men or non-binary also need as fighters. They just haven't, it just hasn't been a culture where they could um, Talk about say it. so. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. totally. So. And everybody, everybody has, you know, issues of insecurity or, you know, around their, their bodies and their sense of, of comfort with themselves. And you never know where those are. And it's just better practice to, you know, to get consent and to give people a chance to, you know, direct the the interaction that is around centered around their bodies. Like That's there's right. nothing wrong with them having the the power to determine how that interaction flows. That's because I that's what I would want. You know, yeah. it, it's it it doesn't cost anything to let somebody else have ownership of that space. And and when you clothe somebody it's a very intimate process mm -hmm. you know yes. you 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 have to touch them in places that are intimate and that are traditionally i mean the whole body is is a sens sensory organ um but you have to be really clean and really respectful and um you know consent is really really important yeah, it's, it's so. really true. And you have to know, you have to know who you're talking with too. You know, there's some people where if I'm like, Hey, sorry, I got to grab your nipples. Like they would think that's funny. And I would know that already. Like I wouldn't do that, you know, <laughs> to a total stranger. <laughs> no, or even to someone I knew who I knew would be uncomfortable with that. But to other people, they'd be like, if Dagmar didn't say that, I'd be like, are you feeling okay? So it's all that's that's part of the problem is that it's nuanced and you have to kind of have already had that experience with somebody so looking at it from the outside is not always going to be clear you have to have a consent conversation you know where it's like hey does that make you uncomfortable if if so i'm completely like i'm sorry you know you yeah. you have to have those conversations but i love for example all of the there's a lot of um in tailoring there's a lot of words like apex to mean the <laughs> Like things like that, which are kind of awesome, where it's like sometimes go ba going back to, you know, it's called an inseam for a reason, not a floor to balls seam, because <laughs> that would be weird, you know, so even though that's what it is. So it's like th right. that kind of stuff where, you know, you can always fall back on formality as a way of, um, of approaching these situations. And that's always going to, that's always going to be pretty much appropriate. So um, I will say that one of the things I love about Heloisa is that she has no compunction about taking this on and, and advocating for it. And, if, and it's natural for you to be like, of course, I'm going to work with somebody once I realize this is, this is something that would really be meaningful for them. Of course, you're going to do it. Of Giant course. Need. And I had no, I had no idea. And once I did, I'm like, this has to happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pleasure. You find pleasure in doing in doing those acts of service for people, and then it sets a great example for other people. So, I think that's that's very very cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope anybody who wants to get on board, I'm like, let's do this thing. Let's do this. Let's do some week a weekend get together, and we'll pattern. We'll I'll teach you how to do it. You can go out and make awesome gender affirming body layers for people. It's it it there need to be more people than me doing it. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I am interested. So that would be awesome. I'm sure we can plan a, a, a Pacific Northwest visit in the, 
Portland uh, area where I can stay at my sister's house and we can get as many people yes, on board. Sport of Kings. Oh, that would be a great sport. Yes! <laughs> that would be awesome. We could do oh, an all-day well. workshop that's just like come and do it as you can and one day of pat of teaching people how to do it and one day of getting as many people as want to be their pattern like mocked up and getting the first the first pass done would be so oh God, that would be awesome so excited. <laughs> awesome and i think both dagmar and i have have tents large enough that we could afford some privacy to do that I have not just my tent. I also have Heloise's tent and I'm yeah, holding all my hostage. stuff is still there. <laughs> oh, wow. All our camping stuff is still in my trailer. So she, I'm sorry, Envelope, you don't get to have her fully. I have all her stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we are, um, I don't even know what time it is. It's eight. <laughs> yeah. So we've gone two hours, which is not the longest interview I've had. Um, and there are two of you. So I, you know, I think that's fine. Um, is there anything else that we want to cover? There's so many things we could cover. It's <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed have uh, avoid <laughs> enjoyed having this time with both of you, um, and hearing Heloise's laugh. It's super special. So it's it's a great balm. And um, anyone from Aiden about watching, this is a treasure. Um, <laughs> very lucky to have her in your lives now. Um, and it, I can't imagine moving during a pandemic and trying to start to forge bonds um, when you can't see people. So crazy, but but also, yeah. The I love Seattle, but it did not love me back anymore. I had too much go wrong at the same time, and mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, the people nice. people loved you. People loved yes. you. People loved me. People. Circumstances involving housing and work and all of that. Yes. Yep. Seattle is one of the most expensive places to live in the country now. So yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for um, traipsing down this path with us. And um, we love all you all. Three or four of you. <laughs> but um, maybe people will watch it in, in uh, the <laughs> reruns. <laughs> and uh, tomorrow, um, oh. Tomorrow, uh, sorry, my brain is just all over the place right now. Uh, my sister and I are uh, interviewing Master Grendel, oh. who is uh, a Lion of Montier and one of Montier's, I think, three Master at Arms. Uh, he's also a Laurel uh, Forged in Fire champion. Um, and, and a he, Muppet. He, he's, he, and, and yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, we've got some He's also been playing since forever and we've got some great old pictures too. So that's going to be super fun. It should be fun. Yeah. So thanks everybody. Thank we'll you. Love you both. Bye. Bye.